It is my honor and privilege to introduce to you uh, an indigenous warrior, an indigenous woman that has brought a lot of fire and inspiration and passion to the indigenous communities across Canada. She's done so with the power of her voice and the power of her mind and sharing the movement forward for our people and giving knowledge for us and opportunity and the tools to fight the oppressor. She's given us that ability to do that in the times that she's got us, uh, got a chance to speak. And I don't want to go too far into our introduction here. So please help me in welcoming Dr. Pam Palmeter. Pam Palmeter. Thank you. It's an honor to be on Treaty 6 territory again. It's amazing. I come from the Mi'kmaq Nation and have some of my Mi'kmaq Nation citizens here and it's always a welcome. <laughs> They're everywhere. Don't worry, we're not taking over your territory. <laughs> but it's, I, I always tell them, I, the minute I walk in the door here at USASC, there's always a bunch of people saying, hey, how are you? How's it going? Hi, Pam. It's like you don't get that in other universities. It's like this university, you're just surrounded by indigenous students and faculty and staff and allies. And that's the great thing about this university. So I'm really honored to talk here today. And I, and I want to make a special mention because I, I had to fly in and I'll have to fly out really quickly. But the one session I did get to attend was the one on murdered and missing indigenous women. And it's really a strong example of how this whole conference is sharing all of your knowledge and wealth and research with outside communities but this is an example of how outside and grassroots communities are coming into the academic institution to teach us because that's what it's all about it really is a two-way street and I think that's a wonderful thing for your organization I think it's a wonderful thing for uh, the University of Saskatchewan um, and I really had to think a lot about what I was going to say today because normally I just walk into a room and say, down with Harper and <laughs> go from there. But this is, this is really important. This is, this is a really big thing. I mean, think of how far we've come. This is the Think Indigenous Conference. It's Think Indigenous by Indigenous people, for Indigenous people. It's, it's how do we change everything? How do we do right by our kids? How do we raise, how do we nation build one little warrior at a time? And that's all of your jobs. And that's, that's so awe-inspiring. It's so important. It's, it's one of the most important things we can do because I'm all about nation building. My focus is nation building. And so that, that puts me in the grassroots level because nation building really is about educating and empowering grassroots people as well as our leaders at the same time because our leaders can't do it alone. But you as educators have the most important people in your hands. It's all of our little people who are either going to be discouraged in school or they're going to be encouraged. You're either going to continue the colonization process because you're not yet decolonized or you're going to help them decolonize and help to colonize yourself along the way. And all of these things are so critically important. We don't have a future unless you save our kids. And you are the ones who are going to have a major role in saving our kids. Parents and communities and families will too. But educators have our kids for the longest amount of time in terms of any external person. So in every other way, think about traditional education. Traditional education, you've got all of the knowledge keepers, you've got the, the healers, the, the people who keep the ceremonies, you pass on your language customs and traditions, um, all of those things. You learn everything from your mom and auntie and, and all of your uh, nation leaders. So in a modern context, you're part of that. You're not a teacher separate and apart from our nations. You're in fact part of the family you have no choice but to be. You have to live the same values and the same beliefs and you have to emulate those and the child has to be able to see themselves in you and you have to see yourself in that child and in that child's future because we all have a stake in it. 
It's not about pay bonuses and pay raises and unions and, and ladder climbing and fighting with the teacher that you don't like, because all of those battles we can do anytime. There's more than enough time to fight with one another over petty things once we save our nations. But make no mistake, we are under attack right now, almost as much as we have ever been, in very different ways, but in very direct ways. Canada's policy to assimilate and eliminate Indians has never changed. It is still on the books. You as educators are going to keep that from happening. Because individuals can't fly around to enough First Nation communities enough times to provide community information sessions on everything that's happening and try to, try to resist all of this. We have to, we have to start when the kids are two and three and four years old. We have to instill in them that memory of how proud we are, how strong we are, how beautiful our people are, how beautiful our ways are, so that we don't have eight-year-olds killing themselves. So that they have the strength and pride and hope and resilience to get through anything, even if it is poverty, even if it is some of the hard times that are going to come. You all have that critical role in doing that. And it's, it's, it's so powerful that it comes with such a huge responsibility because equally you can damage these children in very small ways. Equally, you cannot do right by, the, by these children by focusing on, well, it's 4 o'clock and I need to get out of here. Um, I'm, I'm more concerned about fighting with my principal or I have no choice, I have to impose this, this provincial curriculum when in fact we've always had a choice. There is always a way to resist and if you don't believe me, talk to some of our elders. Some of our elders who were harmed in very horrendous ways in residential schools, but hid and found ways to preserve their languages, that did their dances and the ceremonies in secret to save them and make sure that they were maintained for us. So unless you're going through the same kind of physical pain and suffering for very extended periods of time, then I think we all have it in us to honor the sacrifices that our ancestors went through in residential schools to do whatever they could to preserve their language and culture for their kids and make sure that we go on and pass all of these things because it's the job you signed up for, right? It's, it's, it's not just a career. It's not just a profession. You have the lives of little kids in your hands and this is so incredibly important. All of it is. And I know there's a lot to be said about formal education versus traditional Indigenous knowledge, and there's no reason why those two things have to be different. There's absolutely no reason why there should be a conflict or you have to make a choice in any of those two things. There's no reason why our identity, our culture, our values, our ideas cannot be incorporated in a provincial curriculum. Because I'll tell you one thing, it wasn't just First Nations people who were colonized. Canadians were equally colonized. Canadians were equally brainwashed to believe a whole lot of lies and myths and stereotypes about First Nations people. They need to know this stuff just as much as we do. The myths and stereotypes, all of that internalized hatred and negativity about how awful First Nations people are. We have to get the colonizers out of our head as First Nations people, no doubt. But so do Canadians in a really bad way. So even if you're not teaching in a First Nations school, or even if you don't have a lot of First Nations students, it's equally important that everything you do be a part of your education. It's the only way, in fact, you're going to save Canada. Because right now, Canada's in a crisis. It's in a political crisis, a legal crisis, an environmental and economic crisis. Thank you, Stephen Harper. So who's going to save us? It's certainly not the current political system. The UN has no enforcement mechanisms. And whose job is it anyway? It's our job. It's always been our job 
since time immemorial, Creator blessed us with everything that we have here on the condition that we protect it and maintain it. So just because we've been oppressed and just because we've been colonized and just because we've suffered a really long, hard winter doesn't negate the fact that we still have these obligations. And educators have that extra burden. Not only do you have to teach and inspire and mold these little warriors, but you have to do it in the worst possible context. It's you're never going to get the pay you deserve. So if you're thinking you will, sorry to burst that bubble. You're never going to get the pay that you deserve. You're never going to get the recognition you deserve. You'll probably be blamed by community members and family members and angry parents for things that don't go right. You might even be blamed by some leaders. But that's the job you signed up for because all of that, we need to work on it. But that's not your focus. Your focus isn't to get involved in politics your focus isn't to get involved in battles at the community level. That's not your focus. Your focus are those little warriors that are right before you and making sure that none of these things, the lack of funding, the horrible political context, the lack of legal supports, the failure to implement our treaties, that none of these things impact their education or their future. Because we never had these things before. Keep in mind, since time immemorial, we're not talking about the treaty right to education. We're not talking about federally funded programs. We're talking about multiple generations of us passing on what we needed to know to our kids. And I'm not just talking about singing and dancing and culture and language. We passed on our traditional indigenous knowledges, which included science and engineering and trade, and business, and all of those things that you would find in any nation. We still have these things. We still have these knowledges. We still have experienced people. All of these things need to be passed on to our kids. They need to see themselves reflected. It is time to throw away those history books because we're not an artifact of history. We're in fact still here, and we're operating, and we're still nations, and we still have our culture and language. So if we're going to teach, if we're going to reach out, if we're really going to make a difference, we also have to decolonize our indigenous methodologies. It's not just about fighting to have the right history book. I am not history. I am standing right here, right now. And how many of our kids can articulate our current circumstances. How many students that go to university can articulate anything about Indigenous peoples in a current way? Other than, well, they used to, a long time ago, do this ceremony, or this is what sweet grass means. These things are super important. But if we're going to have a conversation, if we're going to learn how to live today, if we're going to educate our kids today, they have to understand what's happening now. What's UNDRIP? You can just as easily explain that to a child in grade one as you can in grade six or a child in grade 12. And they should know not just their treaty rights, but how the whole world envisions Indigenous peoples. How beautiful we are and how much knowledge we have to offer. Because think about the quality of our traditional Indigenous knowledge. The core fundamental difference is that traditional indigenous knowledge, whether it be science or math or astronomy, was all about how the world really worked. The river was named in a certain way, the fast running river you can't swim in, for a reason, so that you don't drown in it. Or the river with a whole bunch of fish in it that you get to fish in in the spring. It's how the world really worked, not theories about how it should work to suit our economical goals, not about how the world should work so that we can steal other people's lands. The core foundation, the absolute value in traditional Indigenous knowledge is, in fact, its knowledge built on 
since time immemorial about how the world really is, how it really works, how to survive in it, and the medicine to keep us alive. Every time we lose that knowledge or we forget it or one of our elders passes and it didn't pass down, we're losing how to save ourselves. Because I guarantee you Canada doesn't know how to save itself. It's in a lot of trouble and Canadians, our allies, are actually starting to realize this. They want to be a part of this indigenizing education just as much as we do. Because at the end of the day, First Nations are in fact the last best hope that Canadians have of even having a future. Because it'll be us who put our lives on the line It'll be us who, with our indigenous education and our decolonization and the support and inspiration from teachers, that teach us how to resist. Because there is really nothing more important you can teach indigenous children from the strength and beauty in their own identity and traditional indigenous knowledge as resisting. Because for every day that you spend bringing up this warrior in their culture and language, there is going to be a thousand other people and a thousand other pressures saying, you don't belong here, you died, you should have died off a long time ago, and you've got government forces trying to assimilate. That's a huge battle for you to also be involved in while at the same time teaching math and science and education and social studies and art. That's hard. And some of you also have the challenge of, we have provincial curriculum. You know, it won't be changed for five years, it won't be changed for 10 years, or it's only changed in marked ways. There are a thousand and two ways in which you can resist that. If we are going to do First Nation or Indigenous education right, it has to be our way, whether or not we're in a First Nation. And I know that sounds a lot easier said than done, but anything that we have ever done right, it's been because we've resisted and we've asserted our sovereignty. And every time we assert our sovereignty and resist, we are 100% successful. We have a 100% win success rate. Why on earth wouldn't we do that? Why on earth wouldn't we say, this is worth pushing back for? Sorry, province, I'll teach your multiplication and division but every day we're also going to talk in class about an indigenous hero. About someone in the community who's doing something wonderful. About how their family is important and is going to save their nation in the future. About how Canadians can't live with us. About how Canada can't even exist but for our treaty and informal agreements to live here. Those are those are such important things for students to know. And in an urban setting, I don't ever want to hear those excuses. Well, there's too many different First Nations people from too many different First Nations. How can we possibly do this? You just do it. You, you just do it. You find a way to do it. If you have Indigenous students from 20 different First Nations, then you're going to have to map out your courses to make sure that you have those kids reflected in every single subject. That's going to take a lot of work on your part. These things don't happen easily. Think of the Maori when the government said, we're not going to fund your schools. What did they do? They started a school in someone's house. These are the kinds of things that you do the absolute basis of how we're going to change everything and how we're not going to keep doing a disservice to our kids is to resist and change how we go about interacting with everything. Instead of getting a bonus as a teacher for just having worked the whole year, maybe the bonus should be tied to student achievement. You get a bonus because every single one of your kids passed that provincial test and you put in the time and the effort. Maybe a teacher gets a pay raise not because of time served, but because they have perfect attendance in all of their classes. Because those students can recite every single chief that ever was in Poundmaker. 
because they know the real history, the history that's going to matter to them, that's going to make them feel valued. We can't have 100 kids starting out in grade 1 and 10 graduating in grade 12. That's in part our responsibility. Yes, it's also funding. Yes, it's also social issues. Yes, there's also community issues. But so long as we are responsible for a part of it, there's no reason why we can't address it. It would be wonderful if every single parent had the capacity and the health and the wellness to be able to step up and be our partners. But sadly, because of colonization, that is not the case. And at some point in time, instead of looking around at who all is responsible for the, are the failures of these, the education system for our kids, when are we going to step up and say, I forgive us for being colonized? We are colonized. Many of us are not well. There's a lot of illnesses in our communities because of that colonization. So we can use that as an excuse to say, I'm not going to work with that family. Or you can say, through no fault of their own, I'm going to make sure that child's a warrior. I'm going to make sure that this family is tied to the education of their child, that they're tied to the community, and that that community is tied to the overall nation's objectives. How many teachers know the objectives of the indigenous nation of the kids that they're working with? How could we possibly teach any indigenous student without knowing that? What's the fundamental core objective of any education system in any nation in the world? It's to raise the citizens that you want with the values that you want, with the skills that you want, with the knowledge that you want, with all of the nation's um, myths that go with it. So if you don't know that about the Cree or the Dene or the Mi'kmaq or the Mohawk, how can you possibly reach these children? How can you possibly participate in real education, in real nation building? And that's what we're talking about here. It's, we often separate education as a program or as a, some of our, the employees in a certain school, but it's really not. You're really talking about nation building. And we can't do that. We can't nation build and rebuild and heal and decolonize unless you're in this with us. And that's absolutely critical. You have to be in this with us because education isn't just K to 12. Education is everything that we're doing, whether it's the Idle No More movement, whether it's leaders speaking to their communities, whether it's indigenous academics and their research. There's a multitude of ways in which we educate. Not too long ago, I helped educate the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. That's a form of education and one that they really needed. But we're also educating the public. We're also educating our allies. And they need it, and they want it, and we can't keep up. But if we're not working all of these things together, it's not going to work. And this is what I'm here, this is why I felt that this, this speech, this talk, this discussion that we're going to have is so important, because it means we have to look at what we're doing. This room is full of a lot of well-intentioned Indigenous students, current teachers, principals, uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous allies, and everyone's trying to do the best job that they can. I don't think for a minute that we're not. But what we're doing isn't working for the vast majority of our kids, and there's lots of reasons why. So what are we going to do about it? The province needs to step up. The federal government needs to step up, but don't expect them to. We can't wait for them to do that. What's wrong with having Mi'kmaq immersion language courses? In addition to the other education that we have. So you have provincial curriculum. There's nothing wrong with tagging something else on it in addition to it, infusing it. There isn't a day in my university that I don't walk into class and say, what's something wonderful that happened with Indigenous peoples this week? 
Tell me something in the media about where we resisted or where we had a success. And there's 102 ways in which Indigenous peoples have made significant contributions to Canada. They had their own inventions. These are the kinds of things we can be teaching our kids on a regular basis. If you have to do art, do Indigenous art. Bring in Indigenous artists. And I know you've spent three days listening to all of the different ways in which we can include art, we can include language, you can include Indigenous ways. The problem for us is going to be how do we actually do it? And we have to. Because keep in mind, while all of this is happening, there's a political context. And the political context uses funding and law to try to enforce Indian policy, which hasn't changed since the 1700s. And this Indian policy has two objectives. It's to take our lands and resources and reduce financial obligations. And they've only done that in two ways, and still do that in two ways, assimilation and elimination. Assimilation, you go to residential schools, you lose your language and culture, you're taught that you're bad, you're heathen. Elimination, you go to residential schools and you don't come out alive. You have scalping bounties on your head. Our indigenous women and little girls are forcibly sterilized so they can't have children. It's thousands of murdered and missing indigenous women in this country. It's Brian Sinclair who couldn't get health service in Manitoba for two days while sitting in an emergency room. It's Frank Paul who's left to die in an alley because the cops let him freeze to death. One of the biggest challenges we have and will have for a long time is the thing that really hard to talk about, and that's racism. Not just systemic racism, but blatant, overt racism, an absolute hatred for indigenous peoples. These are hard lessons for kids to learn. But what we have to do is make sure that they never internalize that, that they know that every single negative thing that they've ever heard on the playground or in the media or in their own communities is wrong. It's, it's all wrong. There isn't any of it that's true. Our chiefs are not millionaires. They never have been. They never will be, ever. And I don't care who you name. The facts are the facts. And that's how we have to have these discussions with our kids in our classrooms with facts. Not with I think so, not with supposition, not with what you heard in your classes, but you can only engage on these issues with your students. I don't care if they're in grade K, grade one, grade two, or grade 12. It has to be on the facts. The average salary of our leaders is far less than what Canadians make. Okay, so that's done. We're not crooks. This issue around murder to missing Indigenous women is only because our, our men don't respect women and we're the ones murdering them. Okay, the actual factual statistics are Canadian women are far more likely to die from their partners than Indigenous women. So that's not true either. And we have to make sure that every single stereotype that is forced down our kids' throats is countered by fact. And if it's not in your provincial curriculum, then unfortunately that's extra work that you have to do. But it's absolutely critical. Because just anecdotally, the one thing that schools want me to come into high schools and junior highs and talk about above any other issue is dispelling myths and stereotypes not just for their First Nation students, because many First Nation students are, well, they say our leaders are crooks, but I don't, I don't know what to say. How do I respond to that? Because mine's good, but I don't know, are the rest? But equally, because of all of the other students who hold these beliefs and hold them over the First Nation students, and teachers who don't know the difference, teachers who perpetuate this, well, if you just pulled up your socks and were like everybody else, you would be okay if you just worked hard. If your parents just worked, everything would be okay. It's all about jobs and the economy. But they forget. Many of our students don't even come to school with socks on. We don't have socks to pull up. 
We're starting from way behind the starting line. It's not the same scenario. But it's absolutely critical that you reach your students on all of these issues because just like sex ed and all of the reasoning for why you have to have sex ed with teenagers because they're going to hear it somewhere, they're going to hear it on the internet, they're going to learn all the wrong things. The same thing with our identity. I was in grade two and I had my teacher tell me Indians died off a long time ago and the treaties are ancient documents that don't apply anymore. Wow. Uh, imagine what that does to a little person's identity, going home and saying, um, am I dying? Or, like, what's happening here? And thank goodness I had a crazy, crazy family who my brother came into school the next day and informed the teacher in front of all the students, this little girl won't be singing O Canada anymore. She'll be sitting for O Canada until Canada recognizes and implements our treaties and recognizes that we're here to stay. And he made sure to come in every day so that I wasn't singing O Canada. <laughs> Horribly embarrassing, of course. I'm not necessarily advocating that kind of uh, teaching. But it, it actually taught me something. Not only was I alive, but I was alive and I was proud and I needed to stand up and let people know this. And we have to encourage our students to do that, too. Because we're not going to know it all, ever. You can be an expert in so very few things. It's a very tough deal. But imagine how tough it is for the kids, if we think it's tough. Imagine how tough it is for the kids to live this life. And we have the power and the responsibility to do it. And there's lots of different ways. So my focus when I'm working with teachers, whether they're on First Nation schools or not, is focus on resisting. In addition to building identity and including identity and culture in everything that you do, also show the kids how to resist, how to think critically, how to look beyond the things that people say. And we have to restore our language and culture. And I know you've probably heard that in 50 different presentations here, but it is, it is so important to nation building to restore language and culture because, in fact, all of our laws, all of our governing structures, all of our medicine, all of our science, all of our knowledge about everything that ever was and ever will be is all wrapped up in our language. It's completely 100% preserved. There's no book, but books can burn and books can be forgotten. But the language has it all there. We owe it to our students to help them in that way so that they can contribute to nation building. Because that's what this project really is at the end of the day. It's really about nation building. And how many students have you had who have ever dropped out? How many students who, no matter how hard you've worked with or tried to reach out to the family, that they've dropped out? We have some role in that. Not 100%, but we have some role. Therefore, we have some power, some way in to make a difference. And if we did nothing else, if we never had another crafting club or another chess club, but we got all of our kids to stay in school and see themselves reflected in the education, imagine the difference that could make. Imagine, and no iPod at the end of the year is going to do that. It has to be an everyday thing, an everyday, why are, why are you here, why should you want to be here, and why should you want to know more? Your kids should be racing to class saying, and tell me what else I say when that jerk over there says that we're all lazy or we're all this or that we get too much money or we have free education. You can empower these kids to not just defend themselves but to educate the rest of the world. Because you know how, it e how easy it is with kids. Think about little kids on a playground and what it is that they do. Right? They tell each other everything that their parents say and everything that they learn. 
They're the quickest moccasin telegraph transmitters ever. But we can use that. Think about the people who use social media the most. What group in Canada uses it the most? That's Indigenous peoples. And why? Because we're collectives and we're interconnected and everything about who we are as individuals is tied together with one another. You cannot teach these students alone. You cannot, even if you're the only Indigenous person in your school, you cannot succeed at this alone. You have to focus on our power. And what is our power? It's our traditional Indigenous knowledge, but it's also our collectives. Imagine putting those two things together. Look at this. You have a whole entire group here. You have a collective. Your nations are your partner. The communities are your partner. We can do this together. How do you think Idle No More sprung up with no money, no political organization, no men at the helm? How is that possible? Just kidding, chief. <laughs> there was lots of chiefs and, and men at the helm. But I'm just making a point that without money, without money, without political organization, we created an entire movement just out of the people. And we sustained it just out of the people. And the people who were on the front lines were the people with the least amount of hope. The people who had spent half their time in prison, the moms who had lost their kids to child and family services, people who had suffered multiple generations of trauma because of residential schools. The most impoverished people were on the front line dancing in the streets and being proud and celebrating who they were. If the people with the least amount can stand up for this entire country and our lands and our territories and our sovereignty, certainly all of us in this room who have the power of education and knowledge and connections and awareness can do the same. Your movement might not be in the streets like I don't know more. Your movement might in fact be invisible, but it'll be the most profound movement because you will be raising those warriors one little warrior at a time. In another 10, 20 years, even if we never get another cent in funding, you could essentially have your own movement of people rebuilding our nations. And you will all be the unsung heroes. And you won't get any credit despite the credit that's due, but I guarantee you they'll look back in 100 years and say, those were our heroes. Those are the people who saved our nations. And everybody in this room has the power to do it, every single person, because like I said, the power of our people is unstoppable. And every time we've resisted, every single time we've won, when the Indian Act tried to outlaw our, our dances and ceremonies, what did we do? We resisted by doing it in secret, and we hid our regalia, and we kept our culture and tradition. And then we had the Idle No More movement dancing and singing in the streets. We defeated the Indian Act. When they sent us to residential schools so that we would never speak our language and culture again, so we would never return home to our home communities, what did we do? We took the beatings. We hid our language, and we passed it on to our kids. We defeated it. When they forcibly sterilized our women and girls by the thousands to try to end our population, what did we do? We became the number one baby makers in Canada. <laughs> we are good at a lot of things. When they tried to introduce the 1969 white paper, what did we do? We had no money, we had no cell phones, we had no social media. We lived on baloney and bannock and traveled from province to province and slept 20 people to a hotel room and said no until they listened. Their white paper was met with our red paper. And we defeated it. The First Nations Governance Act defeated it. 
the imposition of sales tax in Ontario. They even succeeded in passing legislation until the chief stood up and said, we will shut this province down. And without ever having to blockade a single road, that legislation was amended. In Saskatchewan, where they said, you will never have gaming, that like, never have gaming. What happened? We have gaming. We have a 100% success rate every time we resist. So don't let the province, don't let the federal government, don't let your colleagues or anyone else tell you that this project to rebuild and heal and decolonize our nations isn't possible. Because it is possible, we're in the process of doing it, and the fact that all of us are here at a Think Indigenous conference is pretty strong evidence that we're already halfway there. So think about it. If you believe in the power of our people and you can pass that message on to our kids, then nothing is going to stop us. Absolutely nothing. We may suffer some casualties along the way, we always do, but we will honor those heroes and the heroes that you are by rebuilding our nations. And that's the ultimate goal at the end of the day. It's not the pay, it's not the size of your office, it's not your bonus, it's not whether or not you become vice principal. At the end of the day, the goal is to save our nations because if we can succeed in doing that, we have saved Canada. Against their will, even. But we need, we need these warriors and defenders. We need these future healers and language instructors. We need these little kids to be our heroes. But they can't ever be heroes unless they're emulating the heroes before them, and that's all of you in this room. So I expect it done by next week. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome, awesome words. Uh, we want to give uh, Pam a gift. I have uh, called up uh, our president here, uh, Barry Shingus, and I wanted to call up Andrea Michael also to put this blanket on Pam as our gift from our Indian Teacher Education Program to you for coming here and sharing some brilliant words of inspiration and nation-building stuff that we need to do. So with that, we'd like to honor you with this star blanket that I that I sewed last night. So if you can wrap her with that, 